phrases of the street are not only forcible, but subtle, for a figure of speech can often get into a crack too small for a definition. Phrases like put out or off color might have been coined by Mr. Henry James in an agony of verbal precision, and there is no more subtle truth than that of the everyday phrase about a man having his heart in the right place. It involves the idea of normal proportion. Not only does a certain function exist, but it is rightly related to other functions. Indeed, the negation of this phrase would describe with peculiar accuracy the somewhat morbid mercy and perverse tenderness of the most representative moderns. If, for instance, I had to describe with fairness the character of Mr. Bernard Shaw, I could not express myself more exactly than by saying that he has a heroically large and generous heart, but not a heart in the right place. And this is so of the typical society of our time. The modern world is not evil. In some ways, the modern world is far too good. It is full of wild and wasted virtues. When a religious scheme is shattered, as Christianity was shattered at the Reformation, it is not merely the vices that are let loose. The vices are indeed let loose, and they wander and do damage. But the virtues are let loose also, and the virtues wander more wildly, and the virtues do more terrible damage. The modern world is full of the old Christian virtues gone mad. The virtues have gone mad because they have been isolated from each other and are wandering alone. Thus, some scientists care for truth, and their truth is pitiless. Thus, some humanitarians only care for pity, and their pity, I am sorry to say, is often untruthful. For example, Mr. Blatchford attacks Christianity because he is mad on one Christian virtue, the merely mystical and almost irrational virtue of charity. He has a strange idea that he will make it easier to forgive sins by saying that there are no sins to forgive. Mr. Blatchford is not only an early Christian, he is the only early Christian who ought really to have been eaten by lions, for in his case the pagan accusation is really true, his mercy would mean mere anarchy. He really is the enemy of the human race, because he is so human. As the other extreme, we may take the acrid realist, who has deliberately killed in himself all human pleasure in happy tales or in the healing of the heart. Torquemada tortured people physically for the sake of moral truth. Zola tortured people morally for the sake of physical truth. But in Torquemada's time, there was at least a system that could to some extent make righteousness and peace kiss each other. Now they do not even bow. But a much stronger case than these two of truth and pity can be found in the remarkable case of the dislocation of humility. It is only with one aspect of humility that we are here concerned. Humility was largely meant as a restraint upon the arrogance and infinity of the appetite of man. He was always outstripping his mercies with his own newly invented needs. His very power of enjoyment destroyed half his joys. By asking for pleasure, he lost the chief pleasure, for the chief pleasure is surprise. Hence, it became evident that if a man would make his world large, he must be always making himself small. Even the haughty visions, the tall cities, and the toppling pinnacles are the creations of humility. Giants that tread down forests like grass are the creations of humility. Towers that vanish upwards above the loneliest star are the creations of humility. For towers are not tall unless we look up at them, and giants are not giants unless they are larger than we. All this gigantesque imagination, which is perhaps the mightiest of the pleasures of man, is at bottom entirely humble. It is impossible without humility to enjoy anything, even pride. But what we suffer from today is humility in the wrong place. Modesty has moved from the organ of ambition. Modesty has settled upon the organ of conviction, where it was never meant to be. A man was meant to be doubtful about himself, but undoubting about the truth. This has been exactly reversed. Nowadays, the part of a man that a man does assert is exactly the part he ought not to assert, himself. The part he doubts is exactly the part he ought not to doubt, the divine reason. Huxley preached a humility content to learn from nature. But the new skeptic is so humble that he doubts if he can even learn. Thus we should be wrong if we had said hastily that there is no humility typical of our time. The truth is that there is a real humility typical of our time, but it so happens that it is practically a more poisonous humility than the wildest prostrations of the ascetic. The old humility was a spur that prevented a man from stopping, not a nail in his boot that prevented him from going on. For the old humility made a man doubtful about his efforts, which might make him work harder. But the new humility makes a man doubtful about his aims, which will make him stop working altogether. 
At any street corner we may meet a man who utters the frantic and blasphemous statement that he may be wrong. Every day one comes across somebody who says that of course his view may not be the right one. Of course his view must be the right one, or it is not his view. We are on the road to producing a race of men too mentally modest to believe in the multiplication table. We are in danger of seeing philosophers who doubt the law of gravity as being a mere fancy of their own. Scoffers of old time were too proud to be convinced, but these are too humble to be convinced. The meek do inherit the earth, but the modern skeptics are too meek even to claim their inheritance. It is exactly this intellectual helplessness which is our second problem. The last chapter has been concerned only with a fact of observation, that what peril of morbidity there is for man comes rather from his reason than his imagination. It was not meant to attack the authority of reason, rather it is the ultimate purpose to defend it, for it needs defense. The whole modern world is at war with reason, and the tower already reels. The sages, it is often said, can see no answer to the riddle of religion. But the trouble with our sages is not that they cannot see the answer, it is that they cannot even see the riddle. They are like children so stupid as to notice nothing paradoxical in the playful assertion that a door is not a door. The modern latitudinarians speak, for instance, about authority in religion not only as if there were no reason in it, but as if there had never been any reason for it. Apart from seeing its philosophical basis, they cannot even see its historical cause. Religious authority has often, doubtless, been oppressive or unreasonable, just as every legal system, and especially our present one, has been callous and full of a cruel apathy. It is rational to attack the police, nay, it is glorious, but the modern critics of religious authority are like men who should attack the police without ever having heard of burglars. For there is a great and possible peril to the human mind, a peril as practical as burglary. Against it, religious authority was reared, rightly or wrongly, as a barrier, and against it something certainly must be reared as a barrier, if our race is to avoid ruin. That peril is that the human intellect is free to destroy itself. Just as one generation could prevent the very existence of the next generation by all entering a monastery or jumping into the sea, so one set of thinkers can in some degree prevent further thinking by teaching the next generation that there is no validity in any human thought. It is idle to talk always of the alternative of reason and faith. Reason is itself a matter of faith. It is an act of faith to assert that our thoughts have any relation to reality at all. If you are merely a skeptic, you must sooner or later ask yourself the question, why should anything go right, even observation and deduction? Why should not good logic be as misleading as bad logic? They are both movements in the brain of a bewildered ape. The young skeptic says, I have a right to think for myself. But the old skeptic, the complete skeptic, says, I have no right to think for myself. I have no right to think at all. There is a thought that stops thought. That is the only thought that ought to be stopped. That is the ultimate evil against which all religious authority was aimed. It only appears at the end of decadent ages like our own, and already Mr. H. G. Wells has raised its ruinous banner. He has written a delicate piece of skepticism called Doubts of the Instrument. In this he questions the brain itself and endeavours to remove all reality from his, uh, all his own assertions, past, present, and to come. But it was against this remote ruin that all the military systems in religion were originally ranked and ruled. The creeds and the crusades, the hierarchies and the horrible persecutions, were not organised, as is ignorantly said, for the suppression of reason. They were organised for the difficult defence of reason. Man, by a blind instinct, knew that if once things were wildly questioned, reason could be questioned first the authority of priests to absolve, the authority of popes to define the authority, even of inquisitors to terrify, these were all only dark defences erected round one central authority, more undemonstrable, more supernatural than all, the authority of a man to think. We know now that this is so. We have no excuse for not knowing it, for we can hear scepticism crashing through the old ring of authorities, and at the same moment we can see reason swaying upon her throne. In so far as religion is gone, reason is going, for they are both methods of proof which cannot themselves be proved, and in the act of destroying the idea of divine authority, we have largely destroyed the idea of that human authority by which we do a long division sum. With a long and sustained tug, we have attempted to pull the mitre off pontifical man, and his head has come off with it. Lest this should be called loose assertion, it is perhaps desirable, though dull, to run rapidly through the chief modern fashions of thought which have this effect of stopping thought itself. Materialism and the view of everything as a personal illusion have some such effect, for if the mind is mechanical, thought cannot be very exciting, and if the cosmos is unreal, there is nothing to think about. 
but in these cases the effect is indirect and doubtful. In some cases it is direct and clear, notably in the case of what is generally called evolution. Evolution is a good example of that modern intelligence which, if it destroys anything, destroys itself. Evolution is either an innocent scientific description of how certain earthly things came about, or, if it is anything more than this, it is an attack upon thought itself. If evolution destroys anything, it does not destroy religion, but rationalism. If evolution simply means that a positive thing called an ape turned very slowly into a positive thing called a man, then it's, it is stingless for the most orthodox. For a personal god might just as well do things slowly as quickly, especially if, like the Christian god, he were outside time. But if it means anything more, it means that there is no such thing as an ape to change, and no such thing as a man for him to change into. It means that there is no such thing as a thing. At best, there is only one thing, and that is a flux of everything and anything. This is an attack not upon the faith, but upon the mind. You cannot think if there are no things to think about. You cannot think if you are not separate from the subject of thought. Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. The philosophic evolutionist reverses and negatives the epigram. He says, I am not, therefore I cannot think. Then there is the opposite attack on thought, that urged by Mr. H. G. Wells when he insists that every separate thing is unique and there are no categories at all. This also is merely destructive. Thinking means connecting things and stops if they cannot be connected. It need hardly be said that this scepticism forbidding thought necessarily forbids speech. A man cannot open his mouth without contradicting it. Thus, when Mr. Wells says, as he did somewhere, all chairs are quite different, he utters not merely a misstatement, but contradiction in terms. If all chairs were quite different, you could not call them all chairs. Akin to these is the false theory of progress, which maintains that we alter the test instead of trying to pass the test. We often hear it said, for instance, what is right in one age is wrong in another. This is quite reasonable, if it means that there is a fixed aim and that certain methods attain at certain times and not at other times. If women, say, desire to be elegant, it may be that they are improved at one time by growing fatter and at another time by growing thinner. But you cannot say that they are improved by ceasing to wish to be elegant and beginning to wish to be oblong. If the standard changes, how can there be improvement which implies a standard? Nietzsche started a nonsensical idea that man had once thought as good what we now call evil. If it were so, we could not talk of surpassing or even falling short of them. How can you overtake Jones if you walk in the other direction? You cannot discuss whether one people has succeeded more in being miserable than another succeeded in being happy. It would be like discussing whether Milton was more puritanical than a pig is fat. It is true that a man, a silly man, might make change itself his object of ideal. But as an ideal, change itself becomes unchangeable. If the change worshipper wishes to estimate his own progress, he must be sternly loyal to the idea of change. He must not begin to flirt gaily with the ideal of monotony. Progress itself cannot progress. It is worth remark, in passing, that when Tennyson, in a wild and rather weak manner, welcomed the idea of infinite alteration in society, he instinctively took a metaphor which suggests an imprisoned tedium. He wrote, Let the great world spin for ever down the ringing grooves of change. He thought of change itself as an unchangeable groove, and so it is. Change is about the narrowest and hardest groove that a man can get into. The main point here, however, is that this idea of a fundamental alteration in the standard is one of the things that makes thought about the past or future simply impossible. The theory of a complete change of standards in human history does not merely deprive us of the pleasure of honouring our fathers, it deprives us even of the more modern and aristocratic pleasure of despising them. This bald summary of the thought-destroying forces of our time would not be complete without some reference to pragmatism, for though I have here used and should everywhere defend the pragmatic, pragmatist method as a preliminary guide to truth, there is an extreme application of it which involves the absence of all truth whatever. My meaning can be put shortly thus. I agree with the pragmatists that apparent objective truth is not the whole matter, that there is an authoritative need to believe the things that are necessary to the human mind, but I say that one of those necessities precisely is a belief in objective truth. The pragmatist tells a man to think what he must think and never mind the absolute. But precisely one of the things that he must think is the absolute. This philosophy indeed is a kind of verbal paradox. Pragmatism is a matter of human needs and one of the first of human needs is to be something more than a pragmatist. Extreme pragmatism is just as inhuman as the determinism it so powerfully attacks. 
The determinist, who, to do him justice, does not pretend to be a human being, makes nonsense of the human sense of actual choice. The pragmatist, who professes to be specially human, makes nonsense of the human sense of actual fact. To sum up our contention so far, we may say that the most characteristic current philosophies have not only a touch of mania, but a touch of suicidal mania. The mere questioner has knocked his head against the limits of human thought and cracked it. This is what makes it so futile, the warnings of the orthodox, and the boasts of the advanced about the dangerous boyhood of free thought. What we are looking at is not the boyhood of free thought, it is the old age and ultimate dissolution of free thought. It is vain for bishops and pious bigwigs to discuss what dreadful things will happen if wild scepticism runs its course. It has run its course. It is vain for eloquent atheists to talk of the great truths that will be revealed if once we set free thought begin. It, we have seen it end. It has no more questions to ask. It has questioned itself. You cannot call up any wilder vision than a city in which men ask themselves if they have any selves. You cannot fancy a more sceptical world than that in which men doubt if there is a world. It might certainly have reached its bankruptcy more quickly and cleanly if it had not been feebly hammered by, hampered by the application of indefensible laws of blasphemy or by the absurd pretense that modern England is Christian. But it would have reached the bankruptcy anyhow. Militant atheists are still unjustly persecuted, but rather because they are an old minority not because, than because they are a new one. Free thought has exhausted its own freedom. It is weary of its own success. If any eager freethinker now hails philosophic freedom as the dawn, he is only like the man in Mark Twain who came out wrapped in blankets to see the sun rise and was just in time to see it set. If any frightened curate still says that it will be awful if the darkness of free thought should spread, we can only answer him in the high and powerful words of Mr. Belloc, Do not, I beseech you, be troubled about the increase of forces already in dissolution. You have mistaken the hour of the night. It is already morning. We have no more questions left to ask. We have looked for questions in the darkest corners and on the wildest peaks. We have found all the questions that can be found. It is time we gave up looking for questions and began looking for answers.